Good morning, everyone. It's just gone 10 o'clock, but I can see numbers of participants rising on my screen. So I'm just going to give it another minute before we kick off. We'll just leave ourselves on mute until then. Hello everyone, good morning again. Um, so right, I think we're ready to kick off. Welcome everyone to the Cornerstone webinar on delivering place-friendly renewable energy and staying out of court. I'm delighted this morning to be able to present this um, webinar with my fantastic colleagues, Jonathan Clay and Emma Dring, who between them have a huge wealth of planning and environmental ex expertise. The three of us have also been involved in a number of renewable and energy infrastructure projects over the last many years, so we are hoping to share some of the practical tips that we've learned along the way. To begin with, I just want to take um, a look at what we will be covering today, and that is um, Jonathan will begin by looking at the kind of background context and need. Emma will then take over and look at how to minimize harm and also opportunities for enhancement. And then I will take a look at environmental impact assessments. So um, that's all by way of introduction from me. Um, although I should say that there is a chat function or rather Q&A function. So you can, um, as we go along, feel free to pop your questions there and one of us will try and answer them or we'll come back at the end to have a group discussion on the questions that are raised. So that is all for me, and I will now hand over to Jonathan. Good morning. Um, can I have slide number four? Please. Um, you, you may recognize this fellow. He's called Nero, and he is the man who fiddled while Rome burned. Um, he's also relevant because his name happens to rhyme with net zero. Um, We'll be coming back to him uh, towards the end of, of my presentation. Next slide. Um, I've set out uh, on the slides the, the principal obligations, net zero obligations that the UK government is subject to. Uh, there's a legal obligation to achieve net zero by 2050, an interim target also by, binding in law under the Climate Change Act. Um, and government policy uh, it, uh, is set out in Build Back Greener document of 2021, where they set out their net zero strategy to fully decarbonize, decarbonize our power supply by 2035. I'm not going to read all of these out, but uh, they're there for your back reference, if you like. Uh, file uh, number six, please, slide number six. Uh, and that's, that's more of it. The role of the Committee on Climate Change is to make recommendations and provide independent oversight and assurance to the government's plans. So um, firm and clear commitment from the government to, to uh, achieve net zero uh, and um, a major force within that is uh, the need for renewable energy. Uh, number seven, please. 
um, the, the key renewables that I'm going to be dealing with, because for, for practical effect, they're the ones that you come across on a day-to-day -day basis most frequently, and particularly at the moment, uh, the many applications for solar, uh, a number of those going to appeal as they're turned down by uh, local authorities, uh, and, and those which are over the 50 megawatt um, threshold uh, are dealt with differently to those under 50, uh, as you're probably, probably well aware, 50 plus uh, are, are dealt with under the 2008 Act as NSIPs, whereas the, if they're less than 50, um, they're dealt with under the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, that it is, uh, it, it is interesting to see how many uh, applications are, are 49 or 49.9 megawatts or claim to be. And there is a question that uh, has been asked about how do we how do we tell what's the validity of, of the app? Of, how do we tell that the application is for forty nine point nine meg, megawatts uh, and and not more? Uh, that's a technical question, but the best way is to, is to actually uh, ensure that it's gra it's grants permission for it that it shouldn't exceed its condition of the permission that it doesn't exceed forty nine if that's what you want to achieve. Um, the uh, there is di different guidance as well. The, the, the framework um, actually sets out at paragraph five that there are no specific policies for NSIPs in the framework, of course, but um, N, uh, NPS are material considerations, that's the national policy statements, are material considerations in the determination of smaller schemes. Um, and that, to some extent, in, you find this in many of the appeal decisions, that although they are less than 49 megawatt schemes, they are at the same time considering and treating as material consideration the NPSs because of the dearth of clear guidance within the NPPF um, uh, in, in the framework. Um, and uh, for example, the, the, uh, the draft NPPSs, which are coming forward at the moment, which others are going to be dealing with in more detail, um, articulate the prudence of planning infrastructure development on a conservative basis, including scenarios in which the future use of hydrogen is limited and concludes that a secure, reliable, affordable, net zero consistent system in 2050 is likely to be composed predominantly of wind and solar. And I think we're all finding that on a practical basis, that's what we're dealing with day to day applications for particularly solar at the moment, but also wind. Next slide, please. Um, it, it's interesting to see with the direction the government's going. Um, not on this, the foot, footnote 54 says uh, to the framework, sa says that proposed wind energy development involving one or more turbines should not be considered acceptable unless it is in an area identified as suitable for wind energy development in the development plan. And following consultation, it can be demonstrated that the planning impacts identified by the affected local community have been fully addressed. And I underline fully addressed for the moment because you'll see why in a minute. And the proposal has their backing. Um, that, that footnote is a major obstacle to many wind um, energy developments. And uh, you'll find that, as a pr practically speaking, very little onshore wind is being permitted at the moment. The policy framework is not strongly supportive of it. You'll find some in industrial areas. Go to the north bank of the Thames estuary and you'll find uh, um, turbine development there. Um, but, but generally, it, it has great difficulty at the moment uh, because of the frame, abs absence of supportive policy framework. And, and next slide, please. And the amendments to the framework don't seem to help with that. And I've drawn the, your attention to the proposed framework, uh, amended the pr proposed framework and the amendments in that. Uh, and you'll see that the same, there's, there's significant uh, emphasis on uh, community involvement and, and, and projects being identified by the local community uh, and their concerns 
are appropriately addressed. No, notice the change there in, in terms from fully addressed in previously. So perhaps a slight relaxation of policy, uh, which which is interfering with uh, our um, wind delivery of wind uh, development. Uh, next slide, please. And you'll see that the proposed footnote 63 says development involving one or more turbines should not be considered acceptable unless it's in an area identified as suit for wind energy development in either development plan or supplementary planning document. And again, repeats this need for the uh, imp impact um, identified by the local community to be satisfactorily addressed. And the proposal has community support. No guidance about how community support is uh, assessed. Solar, uh, so there is a considerable amount of solar development coming forward now. And I think all of us, uh, the three, three of barristers in front of you today are, are involved in ongoing solar appeals and so solar projects and advising and representing uh, applicants and local authorities uh, on these matters. Solar farms are one of the most clearly established renewable technologies. It's the cheapest form of electricity generation, it can be built quickly, um, and provided that they've got a decent connection to the main grid, can start to actually deliver in uh, a, a relatively short time, in less than a year, from the grant of permission. Um, and it's now viable uh, to deploy subsidy free the government has committed to, and I'm quoting them, uh, has committed to sustain growth in solar capacity to ensure we're on a pathway that allows us to meet net zero emissions. And as such, solar is a key part of the government's strategy for low cost decarbonisation of the energy sector. Um, next, next slide, please. Now, why am I addressing you for need uh, on the question of need when the NPPF paragraph one 58 says that when determining planning applications for renewable and low carbon development, local planning authorities should not require applicants to demonstrate the overall need for renewable or low carbon energy and recognize even small scale projects provide a valuable contribution to cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, well, the reason that I, I'm doing so is, is because in my experience, uh, not enough is actually said about the overwhelming need for us to get on with delivering renewable energy now in order to meet, uh, not simply to meet targets, but in order to, to, to prevent the, um, the, uh, the climate change con consequences of failure to do so. Uh, uh, and it, it is my experience, my direct experience uh, in, in uh, working for, with uh, promoters of renewable energies that, that uh, Local authorities are still not taking uh, the need for renewables seriously enough. Uh, and the degree of commitment that the government has, even though it's not reflected, in my view, in national policy, national planning policy, that is. 13, please, slide 13. Uh, and what I suggest that you do, if you're an applicant for, for planning permission and, uh, or, or, or you're, um, you have an, an NSIP, it, it is now becoming common practice to prepare a statement of need which sets out the need for uh, and benefits of, of the proposed development in uh, terms of its contribution to the decarbonisation of the UK energy supply. Uh, and th that's a document which should draw on published documents, policy and strategy at all levels, international, national and local level, because we're all in this uh, together. It's the one thing that we are all in this together. Next slide, please. And the reasons for that, they're sometimes described as the three pillars of energy policy, in, uh, particularly in European legislation. It, uh, firstly, that net zero and the importance of urgently deploying low carbon generation assets at scale, that's the first key pillar. Secondly, security of supply, and that's particularly been emphasized by the, the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, and then affordability and reducing exposure to volatile international markets with the way that the markets are at the moment, uh, have, having control of our own 
uh, renewable sources of energy uh, is essential to uh, stabilizing that. Um, and again, over the last 12 months or so, we've see, seen wildly changing uh, costs for uh, carbon fuel. Uh, so the ben benefits of, of uh, uh, renewable energy are set out there on, on, the, on this slide. I'm not going to read those out. I think they're probably well known to us, but I, I do draw your attention to the third um, third point. Um, how much weight should be added, uh, uh, afforded to uh, renewable energy development um, and the benefits that it brings? Uh, uh, and uh, it should be made clear in any application that, that uh, renewables development provides, uh, it, it goes to meeting uh, both the national and local urgent and compelling need for low carbon generation, and that that should be accorded substantial weight. You sometimes get uh, decisions where they afford significant weight or very significant weight or considerable weight. But you're talking about weight at the high end, at the top end, uh, for um, generating uh, low carbon uh, energy. Um, and emphasizing that, it's, it's, we're, the, the, the position remains at the moment that at my fourth bullet point on this slide, renewable energy development is still treated as inappropriate development in the green belt, even when for most local authorities, it's not feasible to put large scale wind for, uh, or um, solar development in their urban areas. And uh, the countryside around the urban areas uh, are very often almost entirely green belt. So the only place you're gonna end up with for practical purposes, finding locations where renewable energy development can take place is going to be in the green belt, but it's, it's still treated as being inappropriate development, and it's necessary uh, to, um, to, to find that, that there are very special circumstances which justify the harm caused by simply being inappropriate development and any other harm. Uh, I, I know that uh, Emma is going to be going into Greenbelt uh, issues in detail in her presentation. Then you've got um, the question of national parks and AONB designations. They don't exclude renewable development, and there's no reason why, provided that the impacts are, are acceptable, that it cannot take place in uh, national parks and AONB designated areas. And of course, valued landscapes. It's a question of fact and, and uh, judgment as to whether it can go proceed in those areas. Um, but again, remember this emphasis on, on community-led initiatives that can be committed outside of the areas identified in local plans and neighborhood plans. Next slide, please. Um, this next slide is, 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 is to address the question of, of the, the actual need for decarbonization, which is growing, as is the urgency for the actions required to deliver decarbonization because the effect of decarbonization will inevitably be to shift people from existing gas, coal or oil uh, um, to electricity in homes and businesses, and indeed with electric vehicles, which are very often now charged, uh, charged overnight at home, if you have one. Um, and for that uh, ob object, the supply of low carbon electricity must increase in order to meet the growing demand caused by decarbonization, as well as replacing existing low carbon uh, and carbon intensive generation stations, which are at or close to their economic end of life. Next slide, please. Uh, the national policy statements uh, conclude that the UK urgently needs sufficient energy capacity from a diverse mix uh, of uh, technologies, and um, the government has issued draft revisions of NPS EN1 and EN3 uh, for consultation. 
Um, and I know, again, others are, are going to be referring to those. The draft NPS states using electrification to reduce emissions in large parts of transport, heating and industry could lead to more than half of final energy demand being met by electricity in 2050, up from 17% in 2019, and representing a doubling in demand for electricity. So benefits of solar, as well as its important contribution to decarbonisation, important role to play in reducing over-reliance on foreign energy sources and volatile international energy markets. It's one of the lowest cost sources of electricity generation, and it plays an important role in enhancing the UK system, complements the UK's existing and growing wind generation capacity. It's turning over 19, actually let's go straight to 20 and turn to mission zero. Thought I'd refer to this, you're probably all familiar with, with this, but this was the report um, by uh, Chris Skidmore MP, Chair of the Government's Independent Review of Net Zero. And that was commissioned to ask how the UK might deliver its own net zero carbon uh, targets in a manner that was more affordable, more efficient in a pro-business and pro-enterprise way. And I've set out some of the key recommendations from uh, Mission Zero on slide 21. And I'm not going to read them out, but you'll ha have this. Um, this slide presentation will be on our website after uh, today's presentation. Um, we, we then see the government's response in powering up Britain. Um, and it's just a little bit cagey, isn't it? Agrees with the review's conclusion that net zero is the growth opportunity of the 21st century. Uh, a de decisive action needed to seize the opportunities, major economic opportunities. Well, we've seen how that's gone with the only prop proposed um, electric vehicle plant, um, which, uh, and we're, we're clearly falling behind others, uh, other the United States and, and Europe, uh, China. Um, who are way ahead of us now in that area, uh, but does claim that the government are partly or fully acting upon 23 recommendations from the independent review uh, report, which had 25 recommendations for 2025. So it's it's been embraced, but uh, somewhat coldly at the moment. Next slide, connectivity. Um, this, this is a major issue now. 40% of approved renewable developments are unable to connect to the grid. And one of the points, if you're promoting a scheme, uh, one of the points that can weigh heavily in your favor is that you're able to deliver a connection immediately. Um, and uh, you'll see that ab absence of co connecting infrastructure to the grid um, means that some of these projects are likely to be delayed between one and 10 years. It's extraordinary that that's being allowed to take place. Uh, and and um, no doubt the government will be responding in due course, but uh, it's going to need major financial investment in the infrastructure before um, we, we are able to to connect up the the um, uh, new generating stations that, that are comprised in the solar and wind uh, development that we're looking to add. Um, it is by its def by definition dispersed. Um, we, we've shifted from having a small number of large carbon-based generation stations and, and, and um, a small number of nuclear um, gen generation stations. Uh, and we've now, we, it's uh, electricity generation, renewable electricity generation is going to be uh, widely distributed with much smaller uh, stations seem seem to take the main lead in in uh, delivering uh, new renewable energy um, stations. So developments located close to an existing point of connection to the local electricity network with immediate available connection can mean that development would be able to complete construction and commissioning quickly post consent and start to deliver against the urgent need for renewable generation developments in the UK. A crucial factor. 
Um, I was going to talk about renewables in the green belt, uh, but I, I don't want to. Uh, I think it, that's going to be dealt with in, in depth by Emma uh, um, when, when she reaches that. Yes, point. and Jonathan, I'm just sorry, mindful of the time. So maybe if yep. we just skip through the sure. next level. Thank you. 25, please. Have we reached the tipping point? Uh, you'll have heard this news within the last couple of weeks that there's now a 50 50 chance of average global temperature reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels in the next five years. Within the next five years. And the likelihood is increasing with time. We're simply not doing it, we're not delivering. Uh, and that's global. Uh, and in the, in the UK, we're not delivering here either. Um, and that 1.5 degree target is the goal of the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, and I've cited the uh, World Meteorological Organization's Secretary General. It's an indicator of the point at which climate change will become increasingly harmful for people and indeed the entire planet. We really do have to get on with it. So I'm going to uh, leave you to read my next 26 of 27, which are the recommendations of um, the Climate Change Committee. And finally, take you to the conclusion. Uh, and here it is, Rome burning. That, that's, uh, is that the position we're in? Or are we actually going to really do something about it? Planning permissions should be granted for as, as much of this development as possible. Um, uh, and um, I, I hope that we can all participate in that. It'd be very interesting to hear your views. And at that point, I'm going to hand over with the last word of the crazy world of Arthur Brown. Oh, it seems to have lost its, has it lost, <laughs> lost its sound? There you go. That was Arthur Brown anyway. Though you all know the song, Fire, I'll Teach You to Burn. I'm not going to sing it for you. Uh, hand back to Rushi. I think I'll take over from here because um, my section now is on minimising harm and opportunities for enhancement um, and obviously in addition to emphasising the need for renewable energy um, in order to give your application the best chance of succeeding, whether that's at local level or on appeal, you're obviously going to want to try and reduce the harm so far as you can and talk them down and talk up the opportunities for enhancement of which there, there are a few that are worth knowing about. Um, so if we start with um, identifying what harms exist that I'm going to talk about, I think the key one, is, as Jonathan's already identified, is, is green belts, a major um, hurdle to applications for this type of development. Heritage assets in the vicinity, another common, common issue facing applicants. Um, and then also effects on landscape character and visual amenity. So I'll try and touch on those. And if we start with my next slide on, on green belt, as Jonathan's already identified, but, you know, that is surrounding um, major urban areas. You can see the extent of it on this plan. It, it, it's basically the highest level of, of policy protection in the planning system. And so therefore the most significant um, barrier to uh, promoting a renewable energy project. Next slide, please. The reason for that is the, the, the test set out in the framework, uh, as I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, is that it is it is necessary where there is harm to the green belt. And there will be for any of these renewable energy projects, if they're located in the green belt, it, they're, they're inevitably going to cause harm to the green belt. Um, and so it's you'll always be in a situation where you need to show very special circumstances. Um, which clearly outweigh the harm by reason of inappropriateness and any other harm. Um, and that's all other harm, so not just green belt harm. It all gets weighed in together and you have to show very special circumstances. Uh, I'm going to skip over briefly the, the elements of harm. So we've got inappropriateness, otherwise known as harm by definition, the very fact of putting development in the green belt, unless you can bring yourself within uh, one of the categories in paragraphs 149 and 150 of the framework, um, then any development in the green belt is by definition harmful. And so you're already in that very special circumstances world. And the reality is that renewable energy projects are, are going to be harmful 
by definition. There might be some elements, underground cables and so on, that, that, that may not be, but you have to look at the, um, the development as a whole. So that's not something that can really be avoided, I don't think, um, or minimised even. So far as openness is concerned, um, as this slide sort of just cited a couple of cases on there, it, it, the meaning of that is essentially the absence of development and in assessing the effect of putting development in a place that, that is free of development, you're looking at primarily spatial, so the space it takes up, the volume of the development, but also visual elements can come into that. And to that extent, there is a bit of an overlap with kind of landscape and visual impact as well. So in terms of minimizing that harm, the harm to openness, I think it's fair to say there's not really any scope to minimize the spatial effects on openness because you, you can't really alter the space that the project is going to occupy. If it's a solar farm, the panels are the size that they are, they take up the space they do, they have to be arranged a certain way. So that's kind of a given. In terms of the visual effects of openness, that is potentially something that can be, it's probably more an issue of site selection. So looking at the extent of to the extent to which the openness of that land can currently be perceived and how that will change and the extent of, of visibility so how will people perceive um perceive that change to openness for example from footpaths and so on so it's partly going to come down to site selection and possibly as i say an overlap with kind of visual impact in terms of what you can do to reduce that effect next slide, slide please um, and then the other the other element of green belt harm, the third element of green belt harm is harm to the purposes of the green belt. I've provided on that slide the uh, extract from the framework which sets out those five purposes. Highlighted C because you know whenever you're on a greenfield site in the green belt, that's already that's always going to be pretty much engaged. The extent to which the others may or may not be engaged again will come down partly to where your site is. So you know for example neighboring towns merging if your site's not between you know two neighboring settlements then that's not going to be an issue so I think it's always worth in the green belt analysis um trying to try, trying to make what arguments you can to to reduce the number of purposes that are engaged because although all of that harm to the green belt has to be given substantial weight necessarily the lower that harm is then the less the less of that heavily weighted harm there is to outweigh if that makes sense so it's always although you can't avoid it it's always worth trying to see ways of reducing it so far as possible in the balance um next slide please so those are the harms um in terms of very special circumstances the framework itself addresses that in relation to renewable energy projects, I've set that out for you, and it, and it makes clear that very special circumstances may include the wider environmental benefits, renewable energy. Obviously, it doesn't go so far as to say that, that that's enough in itself, that that is a very special circumstance, um, just that it may that that may be part of the mix. And as I say on the side, no, it, normally um, a developer will be relying on a combination of benefits. So, which is why, particularly in the Greenbelt case, as, as Jonathan identified, it, it is really important to fully evidence and demonstrate the need and, and show the decision maker where, in it, where that flows through in terms of national policy strategies and so on. Um, to, to, whilst there's a requirement to do that, it shouldn't be taken as a given and you do want to uh, emphasise that as well as um, but bigging up the other benefits to um, to, to form those very special circumstances. Now I've said, um, this is where I'm probably going to immediately become unstuck, but I'm, oh, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? Sorry, I haven't finished. Um, I've identified there that the Secretary of State, so far as my researchers um, have indicated, hasn't granted a solar farm in the green belt since at least 2013, so that's 10 years. I'm sure now somebody's going to tell me of one that has been granted. Um, if there is, I haven't found it, but I think it's fair to say, um, if it's a called in or recovered appeal, um, prospects are not looking great um, for a solar development if you're balancing benefits against green belt harm. Um, and I think it's obvious there's a political element to that. At, at an inspector level and certainly at local level, it's much more mixed. 
Uh, and there, the extent of the of other harms is going to be a critical factor because, as I said, it's it's harm by reason of inappropriateness and any other harm that needs to be outweighed. So that will be critical. And next slide, please. We'll skip through. Um, I don't think anyone would propose putting solar farms near uh, a building such as the Vatican in this country, but there that that has been done in Italy, which is interesting. A different approach, perhaps, to heritage uh, being taken there than is taken in our country. Next slide, please. Um, and there was a question from, I think, Henry Smith of Chris Blanford Associates, I'm not sure if you're here today, about the role of the historic environment in delivering renewable energy and whether the goals of those two things are either aligned or opposed. I think from my perspective, there is definitely, you're, it's right to say there's a degree of alignment because both of these, both of these things are, are, are ultimately aimed at kind of conserving for the future um, and leaving behind, you know, a, a preserved environment for future generations. However, I think it's also fair to say that in our current planning system and with the heritage um, law and policy as it is, it's generally seen as a pretty major constraint to development. It is, it is in opposition at the moment. Um, and I think you know that's something that would be good to change, really. Um, I've just set out some basics of heritage law and policy on this slide. The fundamental point being that both by law and policy, decision makers are required to give great weight um, to any harm to heritage. And that's either, it, 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 as you'll know, in the framework that's divided up into substantial or less than substantial harm. I'm not going to go into the definitions of those, but realistically, we're almost always, in terms of renewable energy projects, talking about less than substantial harm. And it's almost always harm by virtue of locating developments in the setting of heritage assets rather than being a direct a direct impact on a heritage asset itself. What I want to just draw out from this slide is um, in terms of that harm, what we're talking about is harm to significance. So it is that what is of heritage value about that, whether it's a listed building, whether it's a scheduled monument, uh, and the setting has a direct link to that, the definition of that it, it is, it, is, is looking at how that area around the heritage asset, how its surroundings are contributing to significance and how they affect the ability to appreciate that. So if we move on to my, my next slide, um, it follows that the key focus for any kind of heritage assessment and in terms of trying to minimize um, the harm to heritage, it's really focusing on that significance. What is it about this piece of land um, that is, adding to what's of heritage value about, let's say it's a listed building, how does this piece of land contribute to that? Or how does it allow that significance to be appreciated or affect that experience? I've given, uh, so the, the, the classic example is views because the visual elements of, of impact on setting are always um, a primary, primary consideration. And just an extract there from the Secretary of State decision, relatively recent. To making that making the the important point about views that visibility of the site from a heritage asset isn't isn't a test and doesn't equate to harm and doesn't equate to a contribution to significance uh, and so there the decision is saying that if it doesn't illustrate architectural historic interest it doesn't allow that significance to be appreciated if it's just an incidental view that's really a visual effect it's not a heritage effect and so quite often um, in a renewable energy project, you know, you may be developing on a piece of land, a field, um, and there may be some intervisibility, there may be some view of a listed building somewhere in the distance. That in itself doesn't necessarily mean harm. Um, that's the key point to get across. We've got to dig down a bit deeper into why is it. And usually in that kind of scenario, it, it would be if there's some kind of historical association, that bit of land was a piece of land that was formerly part of this big estate um, and it was kind of, you know, farmed from the estate or whatever. And, and so usually there's some other aspect of it that links into significance. So I think that's a really um, clear way of, of trying to reduce the extent of harm um, that, that, that a scheme is causing. Um, next slide, please. I've got two slides now, just contrasting two decisions from Uttlesford. I've seen there's quite a lot of Uttlesford um, planners 
in attendance today so i'm sorry if i get uh, if i get these wrong at all um, just just an interesting contrast because these were both cases looking at heritage impacts and they were both considering there I, I don't know the, the geography of this but there's a scheduled monument called the crump and both of these sites are obviously in the vicinity of that we're just looking at how um the inspector has has analyzed the 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 impacts of these different um, developments they're both 49.9 megawatt solar farms this one was refused and you'll see the inspector identified um, that visitors are able to appreciate the agricultural and societal history of this part of Essex so there is some significance being identified with appreciating the rural surroundings of this monument and goes on to conclude that that would be drastically altered there would be an expansive industrial techscape severing the monu monuments from the rural context. So that I'm not saying this is the only reason that was refused, but that that one was refused. And then if we go to the next slide, this one was permitted, same same size um, of solar farm, um, and in this case. Um, We've got an extensive agricultural landscape that that is of significance, but the inspectors recognizing that the site forms just a part of it, the pump can't be easily perceived. It's only a small part of the landscape, the references to distance, intervening vegetation, lack of historical or functional connection. So you can see just just interesting to contrast, although they're both those both of those solar farm sites were in the setting of the same scheduled monument the kind of factors that are that are relevant to assessing the level of harm that, that will be um, caused. Next slide, please. So I think just summing up on that, identifying the actual effect on significance, trying to reduce it at an early stage, paying particular attention to screening because historic England guidance, if a view is an important view, blocking that view may in itself be harmful. Let's move on to landscape and vision. I think I'm going to skip through this quite quickly um, because, again, I think there's always going to be some degree of adverse effect on landscape character. Um, and Jonathan's already covered that to an extent in terms of AOMBs and national parks. If you just skip forward to the next slide, please, Nina. Um, the key to the level of landscape impact in terms of character is going to be the value. And so, obviously, if it's a national park on AOMB, and that's a valued landscape, it's inevitably going to be much harder to um, persuade an inspector to or, or a local authority to allow that harm than, than if it's an if it's ordinary countryside, effectively. That's all set out in the framework. Um, and obviously, in terms of how localized or widespread, that's going to be one of the one of the crucial factors. But again, it, it's more of a matter of site selection. It's probably not something that you can realistically do that much about. Um, the character will be changed in the way that it's changed. You can't really limit that very much. Um, moving on to visual um, impacts, that, that is an area where I think harm can be minimised. Um, and again, it, it, it may, maybe not so much in terms of site selection, but in terms of the detailed design of sites, where footpaths are, setting back from footpaths, um, screening measures, um, things like that to just to, to, to reduce the visit and these are obvious things really but it's but but I think that's an important way again of being able to reduce that harm if we skip to the next slide I just identified there the la landscape led approach you know I've seen that in in cases that I've dealt with and I think it's um, it's 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 more successful if you're able to show that the whole um, design of this project from its inception has taken into account landscape and that's informed the layout and, and opportunities have been taken for screening and so on. And you can kind of tell that story that that I think is crucial. We keep move forward, please, to my next. So I'm, I'm on to now opportunities for enhancement um, and skip forward. Thank you. Those. So in addition to minimising the harm and talking up needs, obviously, if you can add in any additional benefits and enhancements, those are further things that can be weighed in the planning balance and in particular in, in, in Greenbelt cases that can add to very special circumstances case. Um, as I've identified on the slide there and also for heritage impact, those benefits can be public benefits to outweigh that harm. Um, next slide, please. Just want to pick up on a couple. Firstly, biodiversity enhancements. 
we know um, there's a 10% biodiversity net gain requirement, which isn't yet in force, but is but is coming soon. Um, and, and that's to be assessed by, by reference to DEFRA metric. I'm not going to get into the detail of that, but do check local policy requirements as well to see how they, they marry up. Um, and I've just given a couple of examples there of, of decisions where um, you'll see the percentage increase of biodiversity net gain. Um, and then the weight that, that was given. And I think particularly if, if you're on a greenfield site, um, a, a site that's being used for, for arable farming, let's say, there will be inevitably um, a lot of opportunities to enhance the biodiversity value of that land. Um, and so that is very much an opportunity that should be grasped. If you move on to my next slide, please. This is just an example of um, a master plan that has kind of taken that approach. And you can see the kind of ideas that are being put forward there. And we've got some wetland areas and, you know, wild wildflower plantings, hedgerows, reintroducing field, historic field boundaries, grazing, um, all of this sort of thing, you know, ponds. There are, there are a lot of opportunities, I think, to build in around a scheme, um, significant biodiversity benefits. And that is a major way, I think, uh, of adding value and adding a benefit to weigh in the balance. Um, and it's certainly an approach that I've seen. I think it can be quite a successful one. I think there is potentially an issue with because often these renewable energy schemes are, um, well, temp long term temporary, but still temporary. How to secure these things in, in the long term or in perpetuity is potentially a difficult, tricky issue. Um, which I'm not going to get into now, but just to be aware, I mean, obviously it needs to be secured, but the extent to which it can be managed in perpetuity on a scheme that potentially lasts 35 years, I think is a, is a matter that, that needs some consideration. Um, next slide, please. Just on heritage benefits, the, the, the framework says great weight to conservation of heritage assets. So that actually includes um, not only preservation, avoiding harm, but it also includes heritage benefits and enhancements. So if you can, it's probably more difficult, but if you can find um, ways within the scheme of improving um, heritage assets, so obviously by removing um, elements in the setting that are currently detracting from, from significance, if you can, or, or if you can um, improve views, open up views in certain areas, for example, um, that is something that may go may be given a decent amount of weight and may either go to reduce the level of heritage harm overall, or it, it, it could be viewed as a, as a benefit in the balance. But either way, um, do look for opportunities. And I think the message here would be to have that input from, from a heritage professional early on in the scheme to kind of identify those opportunities. My final slide, please, on landscape and visual benefits and enhancements. I think it's difficult to, um, to really to, to really enhance landscape character and visual amenity particularly. Um, I've set out a, a reference to, from Glivia there about looking at enhancements and what can be done. And you'll see from the last point, it is referencing habitat improvement, cultural heritage benefits. That's against an overlap. These are obviously elements of landscape. So that those enhancements is an overlap. Um, I think it's, it's generally more difficult to, to, to identify enhancements in that regard but if they if they are there they should be taken and without further ado Richie I'll hand over to you thank you thanks Emma that was um great so I'm turning now to environmental impact assessments and the reason why is because when we were thinking about this webinar which is ultimately about staying outside um, outside court I was thinking about the challenges that do in fact end up in court and in terms of trends there are at least two themes that emerge from recent cases so first, in practice, notwithstanding that most people accept that climate change should be addressed and that renewable energy infrastructure is a critical component of meeting net zero, in practice, it would appear that pretty much most energy infrastructure decisions and certainly all the recent NSIPs are being challenged in the courts. Um, and that brings me to the second theme, which is kind of what are these challenges focusing on? And certainly all the recent NSIP decisions have been based on the legal adequacy of the assessment under the EIA regime. So this is why we have chosen this as the final topic for today's webinar, which is on getting EIAs right. Now, in terms of the EIA regime, um, on the next slide, we have, um, I've set out um, the, some of the key provisions 
The EIA regulations, as you'll all know, implement the EIA directive. There are numerous regulations that operate in different spheres, such as the town and country planning um, regs, the ENSIP regs, offshore oil and gas, forestry, and so on. But for today's purposes and for these slides in any event, I focused on the town and country planning EIA regs. Um, now, the, this key provision set out on this slide in the next three, I think, um, which are relevant to both local planning authorities and developers. And um, the text um, is deliberately small because this is obviously not a webinar on kind of um, what the EIA regs say, but on actually how to get it right and apply them properly. Uh, but I just want to flag a couple of regulations. I think I'm mindful of times. So the actual key thing that I want to focus on is that when you look at reg four, which is the environmental impact assessment process, um, it's very important to remember or to kind of note that it's it's not um, a sort of one shot document, which is the environmental statement, but it is a process. And this is why it's so important. Um, and I know it's difficult sometimes in practice for various reasons, but it is so important for developers and decision makers to work together because everyone needs to be playing their part to get to the kind of final end result of a satisfactory and legally adequate EIA process. Because as part of that process, developer must provide um, and prepare an environmental statement. There must be a proper consultation process. And then uh, there are certain steps that the local planning authority or the inspector or the secretary of state is required to undertake, which is effectively to, to, to reach a reasoned conclusion on the significant effects of the proposal. And that's under Reg 26. Um, and then um, the other point, obviously, is that the, the way the EIA regs are framed, particularly Reg 3, is that you cannot, in fact, it prevents you from granting permission unless that EIA process has been carried out. So on the next slide, um, we have Reg 18, which tells us what an ES uh, environmental statement must contain. And then this is further expanded on the following slide, which is Schedule 4. Um, and Nina, if I could just have the following slide, please. And this is not an exhaustive list, obviously, but um, it does set out some of the key things that must be described in an environmental statement. As you can see from this list, it is super wide ranging and um, therefore it can be an obviously intensive exercise. But the question then is how do we get it right? And really, how do you actually avoid getting it wrong? But in order to answer those questions, I think it's helpful to look at some of the recent challenges that have focused on renewable energy infrastructure. So the first one that I want to look at is PIAS, which successfully challenged the grant of DCO for Norfolk Vanguard offshore wind farm that included 158 turbines. And the key issue here was the failure to assess the cumulative impacts arising from the sister project, which was Norfolk Boreas. Now, this is a rather interesting decision because in this case, the promoter of the project had in fact assessed the cumulative impacts, but it was the examining authority and the Secretary of State who decided that um, we should leave or that they should leave the consideration of cumulative effects to the subsequent examination of the Boreas project when that came um, through the process. So this is obviously quite a surprising decision, not least because the ES that had been prepared by the developer had found significant cumulative effects on both landscape and visual grounds. Um, and the decision makers hadn't disagreed with that assessment. So kind of applying um, established EIA principles, the judge found that this was not a case in which the effects uh, assessment of effects could have been deferred. And there was a breach of the relevant EIA regulations and the decision was quashed. Moving away from Norfolk then and towards Suffolk, last March, um, the two DCOs were authorised for offshore wind farms at East Anglia. Now, these were um, also challenged, and there were a number of grounds all focused on the onshore component of the wind farms, which was a national grid substation. And one of the grounds, again, which featured heavily was the treatment of cumulative impacts. Now, the claimant argued that it was unlawful to exclude the cumulative effects of known plans for the ex extension of that substation, um, which would have happened in kind of some years time to accommodate further connections from new projects down the line. This challenge was unsuccessful. Um, what had happened in this case was the applicant had in fact, um, they'd been asked by the exam examining authority. And so therefore they had carried out a sort of high level appraisal of the forthcoming projects, but they'd not done a cumulative assessment because as they identified that there wasn't any kind of um, publicly available information on what those future projects exactly would look like and how much infrastructure they would require and so on. Um, so the judge who looked at this said that this was in accordance with BIN's guidance, 
um, no further assessment had been required and that the kind of potential forthcoming projects were so far down the line that they were not deemed existing and or approved projects. And this is a theme I'll come back to. The last case I want to look at then is the Size World Sea Challenge, um, also in Suffolk, also last year, um, the Secretary of State authorised DCO for the nuclear power station. Now, just to flag, obviously, this is not renewable energy, I'm aware, but it is low carbon energy infrastructure and it raises similar themes that I think apply across the board to a kind of wind farm and solar farm projects. Um, the focus of this challenge was on the decision to approve the project despite unresolved uncertainties as to how the necessary water supply solution, which was required for the operation of the plant, um, how that would be delivered. So there was no solution in place. And therefore, a part of the challenge was that the they had based, the decision maker had failed to cumulatively assess the project as a whole with any potential water supply solution. Um, this was a challenge that I was involved in, but we're still waiting decision. The hearing took place in March. See, um, I think if we take a step back from these decisions, I think one of the trends is that um, the EIA challenges have all focused on the treatment of cumulative impacts. And so this is the area that I wanted to focus on. And from the case law, I think there are a few key principles that emerge, which are of equal application to both developers and decision makers. So just on the next slide, I set some of these out. Um, then I just wanna run through them quickly. The first one is that, um, you know, does the ES provide sufficient information? So this onus in the first instance is on the developer. Now, the extent of information provided and what is deemed reasonable is usually a matter of judgment for the decision maker. But if the ES fundamentally fails to account for a relevant factor altogether, then that ES will be deemed unlawful. So a really ex obvious example would be for like a solar scheme. If you if you didn't if 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 it was screened in as EIA development and you didn't include um, landscape and visual impacts, then that would be an unlawful ES. The next consideration then is. Are you actually applying for a single project, which is a standalone project, or are you applying for something that is part of a wider scheme? So in Sizewell, the example that I gave was that any water supply solution that was needed to actually make the plant functional was necessarily part of the same project, even though it wasn't being consented at the same time. I think listeners will know that the courts are kind of um, wary of projects that have been salami sliced to avoid adequate scrutiny. So, um, you know, do think about this both as in terms of if you're applying or if you're reviewing applications. I, I know of um, at least colloquially of some examples where you've pushed in, you know, you might have a couple of applications for solar farms that are coming, um, you know, coming in one after the other. And they are all to be connected by common infrastructure to the same grid, for example, and maybe even owned and kind of operated by potentially the same developer. In those circumstances, you need to ask yourself whether they should be actually considered as a single project. And if so, you need to be assessing the impacts overall. And then if you are satisfied that there's no issue about project splitting, then the next question is, nonetheless, do you need to assess cumulative effects of any kind of other projects that um, are also, um, you know, have just been consented, for example? Um, and the short answer is yes, you must assess these. But do remember that obviously you're not in, you're not required to go into a, a whole load of detail that's not physically possible to do at that stage. So the courts only expect you to provide the information that is reasonably possible to provide at this stage, because bearing in mind that um, the courts accept that at a few future stage when the second or any subsequent project comes forward, there will be a further opportunity to screen it from an EIA perspective. And then the final point is, can any assessments be deferred? Um, yes, yeah, sorry, Nina, same slide. So um, short answer is yes. Long answer is yes, but be careful because um, having looked through the case law, there's probably only two examples where this has been deemed lawful. So the first is where the effect is not judged as significant and there will be further opportunity for scrutiny. So in that Norfolk Vanguard decision, had the ES not found the um, effect to be significant, potentially the high court decision would have gone the other way. And then the second example from the case law is that, yes, you are entitled to defer, but only where the second project is kind of in Kuwait, no proposals have been formulated, and there's no information available so as to actually be able to technically carry out um, an accumulative assessment.
Now, the very last issue I want to talk about on the last slide um, on the continued theme of cumulative effects is what the regulations actually mean when they direct the consideration of cumulation of effects with other existing and or approved projects. Um, the question of what is an approved project is really straightforward, um, so we don't need to look at that, but there is a lot of ambiguity around what is deemed an existing project. Existing development, which has already been built out, is not generally viewed as a project because it's already included as part of the baseline in any event, so that's not likely to be the answer. So it does seem that existing projects could be those that are in the pipeline, but which are not yet approved. And the question then is, you know, where do you draw the line? Is it an existing project because it has been proposed in some sort of public forum? So for example, you've put in a pre-application consultation. Um, does it need to have some sort of formal status such as um, allocated in the development plan? Or could it be something in between where, for example, you've put in an application, but it has not yet been determined? And then separately, the, there are questions arising around kind of what projects do you focus on? Do you just restrict yourself to look at projects of a similar nature? So if you were looking at a, an airport extension um, expansion, would you only consider other airport proposals? Or would you also look at adjacent highway proposals or an adjacent coal mine proposal? Because depending on what the factor is, so in this example, if it was climate, um, it might be said that the source of the emissions has little bearing on the underlying question of cumulative significant effects on the climate. Um, so, so these are all these questions. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any answers um, because it was specifically a question that was posed in the GOESA challenge, and I've given the reference there. This was to do with the expansion of Southampton Airport, uh, and the challenge was unsuccessful. Now, this specific question was raised. Mr. Justice Holgate looked at the question, said it's quite difficult to answer. There's a lot of ambiguity as to what existing project means. But for the purposes of his case, he didn't feel like he had to determine the question. So it's sort of been left open ended. Um, in the PINs context, there is guidance that says um, that, that that's advice note 17. It provides specific guidance on looking at kind of projects in the pipeline. Um, and that is the guidance that was applied in the East Anglia um, challenge, which was the CACI's um, case reference that I've provided there. So in the NSIP context, there does seem to be some guidance. In the Town and Country Planning Act context, there is uh, no guidance right now. And I think this is something that the High Court will have to grapple with sooner or later, because these are arguments that are being raised in challenges kind of across the country to lots of developments. In fact, it's, it's something that, you know, I've had been asked to advise on by local planning authorities, because they are, in fact, getting so many applications. They're trying to, for example, for solar farms, in this instance, they're trying to work out to what extent they can require developers to include the other applications within their environmental statements in terms of cumulative effects. Um, so as I say, no absolute answers here, but lots of kind of scope for debate. And also, um, I think ultimately, we just need to watch this space because sooner or later, we're going to get some form of answer from the High Court. So that's all from me. And um, we now I think have run over by three minutes, but we're all very happy to take questions and have a general discussion. I appreciate some people might need to head off and we absolutely won't be offended. Um, but I think we could maybe all just stick around. The panelists certainly can stick around for um, five minutes or so to answer any questions that have arisen. So looking at the Q&A function, there is, um, one question about AONBs and national park policies. Um, I don't know, Emma or Jonathan, if either of you want to take that on. Yeah, I can I can sort of tackle that to it. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think I can tackle it as such. I, mean, I think the question is basically about um, AONB management plans and the fact that they don't seem to really get to grips with how climate change will, will affect the special qualities um, of that area that have been identified. So the change in the landscape that will result from, you know, change weather patterns, increased, um, you know, heat waves and that sort of thing. Um, and the extent to which that's, that's raised or, or being addressed in appeals. Um, I think it's a really fantastic point. It's, it's, not, it's not one that I've seen 
um, in my experience, race and appeals, but I think it is, it, it is a really valuable point to make. I think the difficulty with it may be in terms of, you know, actually drilling down to that and kind of being giving sort of some clear evidence on exactly what those changes will be, because obviously we kind of know generally on a sort of national, uh, I suppose national or international level, broadly what the what the what the what how the climate will change and what the effects of that might be. But obviously that can that can vary quite a lot from place to place. Um, and there may well be you know specific features of the landscape that would that would um you know, that would be relevant to, to kind of how that impact would play out. So I think it would be potentially quite difficult to be specific about how those special qualities will change in, a, in any kind of way that's certain. Um, but as, as a general point, I think it's a really good one. And it's not one that I've really seen raised, but um, by all means, I think it'd be a good one to, to test out. Thanks, Emma. Um, the second question that we have is on battery storage facilities and what experience any panel members have on how um, planning authorities or decision makers and um, what approach they take to battery storage and whether they're sort of given the same sort of, you know, uh, treated in the same manner as renewable energy mm -hmm. projects. Um, I think if I kick off on this one, I, I haven't yet dealt with, but I know that there are standalone schemes for battery storage facilities. Um, in my solar farm experience, I have always, um, many of my schemes have included battery storage as a separate element. And I was involved in the Sonica um, solar farm at the NSIP project over the last couple of years. We're still awaiting decision, but that actually all the controversy surrounded, at least from the local, surrounded the battery energy storage system. And I think the reason for that is that, well, in, in some ways it's kind of, was this really big monstrous thing that no one was happy with, but more fundamentally, the technology is changing so much and there's a lot of uncertainty as to what the like individual components are and whether that raises questions around hazardous substances consent. And there were all these other issues that had to be dealt with as well. But putting those matters aside, I personally struggle to see how you can kind of divorce the issue of battery storage from the what we are looking at in terms of need for renewable energy infrastructure. I mean, particularly in the country that we are in. I mean, we're having a very sunny week this week and I'm grateful for it. But the reality is, is that if we want these solar farms to work in like kind of, if we don't want energy wastage from the solar farms, it's not going to be possible without having associated battery storage. Um, so that's my view. I don't, I, I think, um, whoever asked this question is right in that the policy emphasis isn't there, but I think we are moving, hopefully, um, very slowly, but we are moving to a place where we need more policy guidance on all of these matters, and I would very much hope that this would also be included. I don't know, Jonathan or Emma, if you wanted to come in on that. Just I to, think, uh, oh, go on, Jonathan, you go. Well, I was just going to say, I, I, I agree with what Rushi's saying. Um, it's clearly ancillary to uh, renewable development. It's an essential part of renewable energy. The, the criticism of wind and solar is that it only works on the days uh, where the weather is is uh, uh, make, is generating electricity, um, and it, it's an essential part of the, the, the infrastructure that's needed. So yes, it's renewable energy, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, there was a question of whether whether it's being considered renewable energy or not. I think it can be a part of it, but you do also see um, battery storage proposals being brought on their own, not allied to a renewable energy scheme, in which case, I, I don't know whether it's renewable, it's more about storage, it's not obviously energy generating in itself, but it's often um, balancing out the system, as, as Ricci said. There was, a, there was a question submitted in advance about the weight that's given to battery storage and the, those elements particularly in the context of the green belt and very special circumstances. And I had a quick look back at some decisions on that. Um, and there are cases where um, very special circumstances have been found for just battery storage on its own. There's a case, um, land west of Wolverhampton, West Primary Substations 2022 decision, and also land south of Monks Friston, which was also 2022. In both of those cases, a high level of weight was given to battery storage um, proposals. In, in the first case, the Wolverhampton case, it was substantial weight to the storage benefits and reference was made there to EN1 and to the energy white paper in terms of kind of support of that. 
And in the second case, I mentioned significant weight to, to a diverse energy strategy. So I think it feeds in. It's not necessarily in terms of the climate benefits, but it, there are other kind of benefits to that that are allied uh, and which do feed in. And it has been it is given um, additional weight to the renewable energy and the, and the kind of climate carbon benefits. Um, so, yeah, I think it can be part of a, a VSC case and important to, to, to promote that. Um, okay, and then the very last question, which actually Jonathan's already answered in part um, online very helpfully, is about um, decommissioning. So this will be particularly relevant um, uh, to the, I think, well, to many projects, but certainly solar schemes, which are usually granted for 40 years. Um, and Emma, I think you indicated that you were going to answer this question alive, alive, alive. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm going to get yeah, it'll be alive by the end of it. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, it, yeah, it, it's an interesting one. I mean, I think... The, the, the person who asked the question said that their, their experience was that the local authority was um, securing decommissioning and kind of bonds associated with that through Section 106. Um, and that's not something I've seen in my experience, but I, I can, it's obviously a way of doing it. Um, I've seen it generally in a, in a more of a condition controlling decommissioning, requiring a decommissioning method statement um, up front. And I think it's good to probably to have it as a condition um, you know, it, it needs to be something that is ultimately enforceable, and there are more options for enforcing conditions than there are for Section 106s. Um, and so I think the issue with it would be if the if, if it was actually a time-limited permission, you know, and the permission had then expired um, at the end of the life, then, then that's potentially a bit more of a problem. However, um, just thinking about a recent experience I've had where the, the permission was not framed as time-limited as such, but it had a defined operational period, which was the, the design life effectively, and then a decommissioning period so that the, the permission then stays alive um, and the and then the, the, the decommissioning can then be enforced by way of you know, that condition and the method statement that's been put in place. So that, that that's how I've seen it. I think as with all these things, that there, there, there's more than one way of going about these things. So I'm not suggesting that the 106 um, approach is necessarily wrong. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think that that's certainly been my experience. I, yeah. thank, uh, can I just add to what uh, uh, Emma is saying? I, I agree with what she says. Um, the, the, the case that I was referring to is appeal decision for Park Farm, Dunton Road, Herringate, which is in Basildon. Um, and and in that, the the, the, um, it, they did, they de the inspector dealt with it, it as a condition. But there was a further condition that was added to complement that, which is that if the solar farm ceased to export electricity to the grid for a continuous period of six months, um, then you have a, a, you trigger a scheme for decommissioning. So it avoids that situation where, where um, uh, you end up with a sort of derelict solar farm um, because it's, it ceased to, to operate. Uh, I noted from that decision, quite interestingly, the way that the inspector dealt with the 40-year point, because different inspectors, in, in my experience, take different views on this. Some of them say um, it is, it's temporary, but it's so, so long-term, it ought to be treated as permanent. And others like this inspector, um, Inspector Berry, um, said that the uh, impact on the openness of the Green Belt would be reduced because of it. And, and therefore, um, visually and spatially, the proposed development would result in harm, but the, that harm would be reduced. So it's an important factor and can play in favour of your development. If you've got that condition, you offer that condition uh, on your application. Excellent. Okay, well, um, I don't think there are any further questions. Um, so I think um, all that's left for me to do is thank our panel and thank you very much for sitting patiently as we ran over by 13 minutes, but hopefully it was useful and insightful. And um, yes, be in touch uh, soon. Uh, don't forget that the slides and the um, presentation will be have been recorded and they will be online shortly. So if you need to refer to any of the more uh, detailed materials we provided, you can do so at leisure. Thank you.